So we have a very special guest today from the Netherlands, Daphne Emsta. Uh, I would like to introduce about our speaker to you. So Daphne Stam studied theoretical physics and astronomy at the Freie Universität in Amsterdam. Her PhD research was about spectral variations in the polarization of sunlight that is reflected by the Earth. She worked at Kone University as a postdoctoral researcher and analyzed observations of clouds and hazes on Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Then she trained for a year to become a clinic, clinical physicist in the Netherlands. As, but she, she couldn't continue uh, because she missed the planetary research so much. And eventually she returned to science and worked on polarization signals of exoplanets at, at, the, um, at the University of Amsterdam. Daphne uh, also started a research group on planetary and exoplanetary research at ESRON, the, the Netherlands Institute for Space Research. She is deeply involved in the SPEX instrument, a small spectral polarimeter for planetary remote sensing, which will be launched in 2024 on board of Earth observation mission by NASA. She is uh, an associate professor of planetary sciences at the Technical University in Delft and works on the SPEX instrument and other small polarimeters. And she studies atmospheres of planets, including exoplanets. And she is also involved in the ESA's Envision mission towards Venus. So thank you so much, Daphne, for accepting our webinar invitation. And I'm very looking forward to hearing about your ongoing research and plans. So mm -hmm. I'm going. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, a nice introduction. <laughs> So I stop sharing. So please feel free to share your screen and start your seminar. Yes. So, uh, well, yeah, good, good afternoon or good morning. Um, so um, I'll start with a nice picture of a dung beetle. So as you can see, dung beetles are uh, very interesting little creatures. Uh, so they can make this very nice uh, ball of dung. But what is more impressive, I think, is that they can see polarization. So they can orient themselves and keep walking in straight line with their uh, ball of dung uh, by observing the vibrational direction of the light of the sky. Uh, so that is very special, I think. We cannot do that. So we cannot really see polarization with our eyes. Well, a little bit, but you really have to know how to do it. So you cannot orient yourself with that, uh, with that technique. But of course, we can measure polarization. And so uh, that's what the presentation is about. And so polarimetry is a tool for characterizing planets and exoplanets. So what is polarization? Um, we define the degree of polarization of light as the amount of polarized flux, so the amount of light that has a certain preferential vibrational direction over the total flux. And so the amount of light, just the total amount of light. So the interesting thing is that sunlight and, and basically light of any star, when you integrate it over the star, is unpolarized. So the light waves have arbitrary uh, vibrational directions. So you can see it here in this picture. Uh, so this unpolarized light uh, hits the planet and is partly reflected. And this reflected light that has been scattered by the gas particles in the planetary atmosphere, by cloud particles, by haze particles, it has been reflected by the surface if there is a surface on the planet that light will usually be polarized. So there is a preferential vibrational direction in the light waves. So if the degree of polarization is zero, then the vibrational directions are arbitrary, like the incoming sunlight or starlight, 
And uh, if the degree of polarization is one or 100%, then all the light waves have the same vibrational direction. And so in nature, it's usually somewhere in between. So there are lots of uh, nice things about measuring this degree of polarization because it is very sensitive to the illumination and viewing angles. So the degree of polarization of a planet will change when the illumination angle and the viewing angle, so the phase angle changes. And it is very sensitive to the properties of the atmosphere. So the, the, the particles in the atmosphere, where they are in the atmosphere, and also the surface properties, if there is a surface. And then because these optical properties depend on the wavelength, the degree of polarization also depends on the wavelength. And so at short wavelength, you will see a different degree of polarization than at longer wavelengths. What is also very nice about the degree of polarization is that it's a relative measure. So it is independent of distances and radii. Yeah? So if you measure the degree of polarization of a planet, you can interpret it without having to know how far away the planet is or how large the planet is because, well, it's, it's a relative measure. Um, it's also independent of the total flux of the incoming light. So if you are not sure about it, that's not really a problem. And it's also independent of many instrumental effects. For example, if your detector is degrading in time, well, it will usually degrade in the same amount for polarized flux as to the total flux. And so the degree of polarization remains the same. So that makes, that enables uh, doing polarization measurements very accurately. Of course, there are also disadvantages. I'll come back to that later. So, here is a classic example of what you can do with polarimetry. And, uh, and this in this example is that the composition and the size and the altitude of the particles in Venus's main cloud deck were derived from polarimetry. Polarimetry from the ground, so from the Earth, and also disk integrated. So Venus is not resolved, it's just one dot of light. And so Jim Hansen and, and Gail Pogonier, already in the 70s, they used this ground-based polarimetry uh, at three wavelengths, and then also at a whole range of phase angles of Venus to derive uh, the properties of the cloud particles. So in these two plots, you can see the little dots, those are the measurements. And so Hansen and Hogenier did not take these measurements themselves. They, they just took a lot of measurements from the literature. So there are different, you can see, well, it's very small, different symbols for different data sets. And, and then they uh, fitted computations of the degree of polarization to the measurements. And so on the left, you can see that the degree of polarization of Venus varies, well, like between 5% here to, uh, to minus 4% and then to 2% here. Um, so the sign of the polarization indicates the direction of polarization. So if the sign is positive in these, in these plots, that means that the light is polarized perpendicular to the plane that contains the sun and Venus and the observer. If the sign is negative, it just means that the light is polarized parallel to this plane. So the sign gives you extra information about the direction and that holds information about the particles. And so from comparing this data with various computations, they could derive that the particles of the clouds have an effective radius of 1.05 microns, a very narrow size distribution with a variance of 0.07. And they also could derive that these particles are composed of 75% sulfuric acids. And later in situ measurements confirmed this these, 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 uh, derivation, so their analysis. Um, so this is a very strong and example of what you can do with polarimetry. And the interesting thing is that you cannot derive these cloud particles from total flux measurements, because of course people have tried to do it, and these flux measurements can be fitted by lots of different types of clouds. So that is also very important. You can get extra information that you cannot get from the total flux measurements. 
So here is a more recent example of polarimetry of Venus. And, um, and before the talk, I already explained that these are a bit of weird measurements. So what you can see here is Venus, in this case, spatially resolved um, observations with the William Herschel telescope on La Palma. So here you can see the planet in the total flux, so nice and bright. You can see the cloud deck completely cloudy. This is the subsolar point. And then on the right, you can see the degree of polarization. Um, these measurements were taken with a very accurate polarimeter. So uh, the, these observations have a precision of about 10 to the minus four. So um, change in the degree of polarization of 10 to the minus four can be detected. And what we can see in these measurements is uh, a whole set of rings. They also depend on the wavelength, the rings. So at the longer wavelength, there were no rings, but yeah, but those observations were also taken when Venus was already close to the horizon, disappearing in a haze. And, and so we have, we have thought for a long time about what could cause these rings. And it can actually be caused by a density wave, a density wave in the gas above the clouds. So when you have more gas particles, the degree of polarization is slightly higher than when you have less gas particles. And this density wave changes the amount of particles. And so the wave could, could be caused by heating around the subsolar point. And actually, these waves are also detected in the Earth's atmosphere after, for example, an earthquake. Uh, except they have not been detected in polarimetry because there is not a very accurate polarimeter in space. So, and again, the interesting thing here is that these rings are invisible in the total flux measurements because the gas above the clouds is just a very thin layer. And so you cannot, you cannot see anything in here, also not when zooming in on the data. So this is a, yeah, a very intriguing uh, measurement. Unfortunately, we have only one set of measurements. So there is still some uncertainty um, whether they are actually valid or not. So why is polarization such a strong tool? And the main reason is that the degree and the direction of the polarization of the light that has been scattered only once, so singly scattered, by particles is very sensitive to their size, composition, and shape. And here you can see measurements. The black line is a measurement. On the left, the flux of the scattered light, and on the right, the degree of linear polarization. These measurements have been done by Olga Munoz from the Astrophysical Institute in uh, Granada. And she runs the Amsterdam Granada Light Scattering Database. That's online. And so the black line are measurements in the lab for uh, particles that are irregularly shaped and made of olive wine. And then the, the yellow and the blue line are fits to the data. And so here on the right, you can see that the yellow line, um, well, is also a fair, it was, it, it's a reasonable good fit. And that is with spheres that have the same size as the olive wine particles. Uh, but if you have spheres that have, um, the same size and also the same composition. So the yellow line is different composition. You can see that the, the line fits the data at the small scattering angles, but it does not fit at the longer scattering angles. Uh, but what you can see is that across most of the scattering angle range, you, you will be able to find a fit with spherical particles while the actual particles are non-spherical. But then if you look in the degree of polarization, you can see a huge difference between the different lines. And so by looking at the polarization, you would be sure that the spheres are not a good fit to the data. So this shows you how polarization gives different information and is more sensitive to the microphysical properties. And so when, if you would only measure fluxes, you can fit lots of different things. If you also measure polarization, it's more difficult to fit your data. So that is a disadvantage. But of course, uh, once you have a fit, you, you are more sure that it's an actual good fit. And then that was single scattered light. But of course, if you have a planet with an atmosphere, a lot of light will be multiple scattered. So it will go from particle to particle. And also the nice thing of polarization is that it's multiple scattered light. Um, is mostly unpolarized because it's randomized. And so 
the degree of polarization of a planet as a whole with multiple scattering in there, and this is a computation for a planet with uh, a cloud and gas and single and multiple scattering, yeah, it's a function of the phase angle. Um, the shape of the polarization, so where the peaks are and especially where these neutral points are, where the degree of polarization is zero, the shape remains more or less the same. So the amount of polarization, the absolute value will change, that will decrease when you add multiple scattering, but the shape remains the same. The shapes gives you the information. So here you can see the multiple scattering plots of the whole planet, and here are small plots for different types of cloud particles, so not gas, only the cloud particles. And, uh, and the particles that are in this atmosphere are the particle C. So you can see that the peak is at the same location here, the, the valley here, and also the neutral points remain more or less in the same location. So that is also very nice polarimetry. So the information is saved, even when you add small scattered light. There is also a disadvantage, of course, so otherwise everybody would be doing polarimetry. And a disadvantage is that at small phase angles, the degree of polarization is usually very low. So at a phase angle of zero, it will usually be zero actually because of symmetry. And so when you are sitting on the earth and you are observing planets, outer planets especially, the phase angle will always be very small. And so the degree of polarization will always be very small. And here is an example of measurements of Jupiter in four spectral bands, spatially resolved. This is a paper by Will McLean et al. And um, so from the UV to the, to the red, basically, observations. And the blue is low polarization, and the red is high polarization. Um, and so, well, you can see that the degree of polarization is not very high. So the highest is about 4% at the poles. And you can also see, it's interesting, is the change of the polarization with the wavelength. So at the shortest wavelength, the polarization is sensitive to the amount of gas above the clouds and above, and above the hazes because Rayleigh scattering is, uh, is strongest at the shortest wavelength. Uh, so here you can see mostly gas above the clouds and a little bit of the cloud structure below. This red is, um, is, is are the polar hazes. So these are photochemically uh, induced hazes with very fractal-like particles. So at a slightly longer wavelength, you can see the familiar band structure of Jupiter. This is the uh, great red spot, this, this yellow thing. So this actually is below the spot. You can see here the, the red spot. So there is something here, like maybe an ice cloud. Here, it's an it's a interesting feature. Um, and the haze is still very strong here. The longer the wavelengths get, the less you see of the gas. And so you get the polarization of the clouds. And here at a very long wavelength, you can see that the, most of the banded structure has disappeared because the, the signal of the gas has disappeared. And so you are less sensitive to cloud altitudes. This little red thing actually is, um, is a shadow. Of Ganymede. Um, so there is very interesting information here, but the degrees of polarization are very small, and you also do not have a range of phase angles. Yeah, so, and especially the phase angle range gives you the information. So, of course, we did some fits on the data, but because of the lack of phase angle range and the small values, it's still difficult to fit. That's, that's the problem with polarimetry. Uh, from the Earth. And so if you're sitting here on the Earth and you're looking out, then the, the planets are always seen uh, at a very small phase angle. Of course, when you're looking in at Venus, you can see Venus at a lot of phase angles. So when you want to do polarimetry of an outer planet, you should go to space because from space, from an orbiter or a flyby, you can observe a planet from different phase angles. And so that allows you to get the angular pattern of the polarization. So there have been orbiters, quite some actually, with polarimetric capabilities. So not really, usually not really full polarimetry, not at a lot of wavelengths. But there's a whole list here. Uh, so Pioneer Venus, for example, uh, had a polarimeter 
the Voyagers of the Pioneer 10 and 11. The Mars 5 lander of the Soviet Union uh, also had polarimeter, but it worked only for a very short time. Galileo Huygens lander had also a partial polarimeter. Cassini had a filter with polarimetry. Venus Express uh, uh, of ESA did not actually have a polarimeter, but it had SpeakOff. And SpeakOff is an AOTF spectrometer. And the AOTF has two channels that are sensitive to different polarization directions. So they could use SpeakOff to get some polarization information. Unfortunately, the calibration for the polarization part um, had not really been done beforehand because, well, there was no plan to do polarimetry. But there is very interesting data on especially the glory uh, in the cloud particles. And then here at the bottom of the list, I have listed Envision. So that's the new ESA mission to Venus. And, uh, and actually, uh, there is some discussion now to maybe add a partial polarimetry to Venspec H. So that would be very interesting. Yeah, so for plants in the solar system, Venus is a target to observe from the Earth, and otherwise you have to go in space. And of course, also if you want to observe Venus from, uh, from different directions and spatially resolved, it's better to go to space. But of course, uh, the solar system planets are not the only planets. And so also exoplanets are very interesting targets, actually really interesting targets for polarimetry. Because from Earth or from a telescope, around Earth or a telescope in L2 or so, an exoplanet can be observed at a whole range of phase angles. And the range of phase angles depends on the inclination angle of the orbit of the planet. And so if the orbit is seen uh, phase on, uh, you can see the planet basically only around 90 degrees phase angle. But if the orbit is a bit inclined, then you will see the planet going through a range of phase angles. Um, and so, so yeah, for most exoplanets, there will be a range of phase angles. Uh, and of course, which phase angles you can actually observe of an exoplanet also depends on the telescope. Yeah, so for example, if there is a star shade, you might lose uh, a lot of phase angles. Um, so that all depends on the instrument and the telescope. So for exoplanets, well, I'll start with the problem. That is that, of course, exoplanets uh, are very faint uh, and, and their signal is hidden, usually hidden in the signal of the star. And so you have very few photons to work with. And with polarimetry, you have to divide the photons into different vibrational directions. So that is very challenging. And that is a little, that's a problem of polarimetry for exoplanets, but there are ways to work around it. Uh, and there are lots of advantages to actually put in the efforts to work around it. So as I mentioned, exoplanet geometries can cover a wide phase angle range, and it always includes 90 degrees which is interesting for gas scattering, radius scattering. Um, polarimetry can also enhance the star-planet contrast. Eh? So it, the, the, if the star here have a nice picture of the star, the starlight is basically unpolarized and the planet is polarized. So if you find a polarized signal in, near your star, yeah, it is probably a planet. And also you might be able to find a polarized planet signal inside this huge blob of starlight. And if this block that you find, the, the, the small block, the planet block, is indeed polarized, you will also know that it is probably a planet and not something of a star in the background. So it can also confirm the nature of the detected object. And then, of course, you can use the polarization signal of the exoplanets to characterize the planets. That, of course, depends on how accurate you can measure it. Yeah? And for exoplanets especially, it is interesting that the degree of polarization is independent of the distances, the radius of the planet, uh, because you might not know that uh, those that, that accurate. And if you have a telescope on the Earth itself, the degree of polarization is also insensitive to the transmission through the Earth atmosphere. So you will lose photons, again, even less photons, but the degree of polarization of your exoplanet will be undisturbed. So there are lots of advantages. And especially, of course, we are interested in 
getting information about exoplanet properties because there are lots of different exoplanet detection methods. Eh? We, we know, know now uh, more than 5,000 exoplanets. So basically every star in the sky has exoplanets. So how can we know what they look like? So this is a beautiful artist impression of planets around the TRAPPIST-1, uh, in the TRAPPIST-1 system. And so there are uh, seven planets uh, orbiting this red dwarf star. But we, so we know the sizes of these planets and also their masses because they interact with each other gravitationally, um, but we do not actually know what they look like. Uh, so here are again some artist impressions of what these planets might look like based on the distance to the star and on their size. And so it might be that there are a few planets in there that look a little bit like the Earth, maybe some look more like Venus and have Venus-like climates. Um, of course, the James Webb Space Telescope will target these, uh, these planets and it will do transit spectroscopy. But with transit spectroscopy, you do not get information about the lower atmosphere and also not about the surface. So we want to know what planets look like. So what do we want to know? We want to know their atmospheric composition structure of the atmosphere and the temperature, the surface composition, uh, the structure and the temperature. And of course, very important is, is there liquid water? Because that's very important for life on Earth. We want to know their rotational period and whether they are inclined, so whether there are seasons or not. Uh, we are interested in moons, uh, tides, magnetic field, plate tectonics, and of course, uh, are they actually inhabited? Is there vegetation, some type of vegetation on the surface or not? You cannot get all of this with polarimetry, um, but the liquid water is very important. And so that is something you could actually do with polarimetry. So this is a very nice artist impression of uh, the planet around Proxima Centauri B. Um, so yeah, that might be, uh, that, that looks like an interesting landscape, but we don't know. So in order to do this polarimetry of, of exoplanets, of course, we need huge telescopes on the ground or a big telescope in space, the VFT, the ELT. Uh, and we want to measure starlight that is reflected by the planets from the UV to the near infrared, because that is the strongest polarized signal. You can also do thermal radiation measurements because the thermal radiation that is emitted by, by the planet will also be scattered by clouds and hazes in the atmosphere, and that will polarize the signal of the thermal radiation. Because of the symmetry, the degree of polarization of the thermal radiation is expected to be very low, but might still be interesting. Um, and so there are plans to have polarimetry for exoplanetary instruments. Well, there is actually the sphere instrument already on the VLT. There is a plan to have an, a polarimetric camera for Earth-like exoplanets, EPIX, on the ELT. Then there is the Nancy Roman Space Telescope that will have uh, polarization capabilities. And also in the plans for Louvre, for example, and HABEX, uh, there are also plans to have polarimetry in there. And of course, to know exactly what should be measured and how accurate it should be measured, well, we need measurements of solar system planets or model computations. I have here an, an, an example of an actual detection of a planet in polarization with sphere on the VLT. And so here you can see uh, the star that, is, uh, that has a circumstellar disk around it. And here is the planet. And the, the line indicates the direction of polarization. And so usually for a for, for polarization that is due to scattering in the atmosphere, you would expect the degree of the direction of polarization to be perpendicular to the line between the planet and the star. This direction is a little bit off, and that can indicate that there's also a polarization signal of the thermal radiation mixed in here because it's a relatively hot planet. So there are already some, some detections of polarization of planets. So model computations are needed to know what you can measure, uh, especially for these huge, very expensive space telescopes. And here you can see some simulations of the degree of linear polarization of Jupiter-like planets. 
uh, across all phase angles. So on the left is the flux, the total reflected flux normalized, and then uh, and to the geometric albedo of the planet, and then on the right, the degree of polarization. And so these computations are in the J-band and then for three different types of atmospheres. A gas atmosphere, so that's the clear one, black line, very smooth going down. Uh, then the clear atmosphere with the cloud added, that's the blue line. As uh, you can see here, a little bit of a glory signature, that's, so that's a reflective um, reflection in the cloud particles. And then when a haze is added on top of the cloud, you get the purple line. So you can see that there is some variation over here, but there is very little structure in this flux. And then in the degree of polarization, when you have only gas, you have a very high polarization around 90 degrees, because that's the Rayleigh scattering. Uh, then the cloud decreases its polarization because the cloud particles have their own polarization pattern. And then when you add in the haze, the polarization changes again, because then you have the mixture of the cloud and the haze particles that determines the polarization. So there is quite a difference in the, uh, the angular pattern of the polarization for these three different atmospheres. So this is in one band, the broadband measurement or model simulation. Then if you look at its uh, spectrally resolved, you get something like this. So uh, the same model atmospheres, again, the flux and the degree of polarization. And so here you can see absorption bands of methane. So a uh, Jupiter-like amount of methane was added to the atmospheres. And so in the flux, you can clearly see all the bands. When you add a cloud, the flux will be higher in the continuum. And you can also see a variation in the depth of the bands because the clouds will hide part of the methane. And so you have less absorption. You can also see that the haze only changes the flux a little bit. But then in the polarization, you can again see that the curves are very different. And so in the blue, the Rayleigh scattering is the most important scattering. So that gives your planet a degree of polarization of about 30%. Then with increasing wavelength in the clear atmosphere, uh, you have less and less flux, so less multiple scattering and higher polarization. And here with the clouds, at longer wavelengths, you see more of the clouds. So the polarization in the continuum is determined by the clouds. And then the haze changes that continuum polarization. You can also see the methane absorption bands. And that is because when you have absorption, um, there is less multiple scattering. And so the degree of polarization decreases less when multiple scattering is added. That's not the whole explanation, because what you can see here is that when you have haze in the atmosphere, this deep band basically disappears. And that is because when there is absorption, you also probe a different part of the atmosphere. So when you have a lot of absorption, you only see the high part of the atmosphere, and the polarization signal is determined by the particles, the gas and the haze, in the high part of the atmosphere. So there are different effects that determine the polarization in the absorption bands, which is very interesting, I think. So you can also get information about the depth of the atmosphere. Uh, of course, you have very few photons in these absorption bands. So this has actually been measured for the Earth, this absorption band change of polarization. And these are ground-based measurements looking up with a GOM instrument that was a remote sensing spectrometer uh, uh, on an ESA mission a long time ago. And, uh, and so we had a copy of the instrument on the roof of the building. Uh, and so we did measurements of the polarization of the sky uh, with a poly polarimeter in front of the spectrometer GOM because GOM did not have this very high uh, spectral resolution polarimetry. So we added polarization filters. And the three lines are for three different solar zenith angles. So they are for different scattering angles. So this is for a low sun very early in the morning. And this is for a sun that's higher in the sky. And you can see indeed here absorption bands. So this is the absorption band of oxygen, the oxygen A band. There's also absorption band over here 
of oxygen in here, a small one. Also water vapor band over here. Uh, what you can also see is high polarization in the UV because there's a lot of absorption by ozone. A lot of absorption, then very little multiple scattering, so high polarization. Um, and so, and, and here at the longer wavelengths, you can also see the dip in the polarization. And that is because of light that is reflected by the surface, then went up into the atmosphere and then came down again to our instruments. And because the institute was surrounded by vegetation, you can here see the albedo of the vegetation. So this is the red edge of the vegetation. And so the polarization of the surface is very low. So uh, in the long wavelengths, the albedo is high. So a lot of unpolarized light is scattered back to the atmosphere and then down again. Um, so this increase here is due to the Rayleigh scattering. And then there is also all these features over here. And that is rotational Raman scattering by the gas in the atmosphere. That is an, um, an inelastic scattering process. And these features reflect the Fraunhofer lines in the solar spectrum uh, because of the inelastic scattering. So uh, yeah, so indeed we can see here the high polarization in the absorption bands. It has also been absorbed uh, observed to go down in a few measurements when there was uh, volcanic ash high in the atmosphere, but not during our measuring campaign. Um, and so, um, yeah, so a different type of, of model calculation shows us how we could find indeed whether or not an actual planet has liquid water clouds. And yeah, so that's the first step, liquid water clouds. Um, and so, these are computations by Theodora Carolidi, who's now in Florida. And, and she computed the flux of a planet that is covered by water, liquid water clouds, but also ice water clouds. So she took an actual cloud coverage measured from the, with the MODIS satellite. Um, and so there was about 64% liquid water clouds on the planet and about 36% ice clouds. And so also double layers, so water clouds covered by ice clouds. And here on the left, you can see the total flux at 550 nanometers and 865. So yeah, nothing much happens in this flux. But then in the polarization, you can see the radius scattering here around 90 degrees. This is the strongest by the shortest wavelength. And then this peak over here, that is the rainbow, the primary rainbow. And so we see a rainbow in the sky when the sun shines and there are rain droplets, uh, but there is also a rainbow when sunlight is scattered in the clouds droplets. We cannot see it with our eyes because you cannot see it in flux. Yeah, that has to do with the difference in size between cloud droplets and rain droplets, but in the polarization it is there. So this is the rainbow. And this rainbow feature is very persistent. Yeah, so even uh, if not a complete planet is covered by water clouds, liquid water clouds, uh, even if there are ice clouds that do not have the rainbow, you will still be able to see it. So searching for the rainbow in polarization could tell you whether or not the clouds are made of liquid water. Then, of course, you are also interested in finding liquid surface water because you might have liquid water clouds but not actual water on the surface, that could happen. Uh, and here you can see some simulations uh, by actually a, a former master student of mine, this is his master project, uh, Victor Trace. And, and he did computations for a planet that's covered by an ocean with waves. Yeah, so the, and the wave shape altitude depends on the wind speeds. So he took actual Earth-like wind speeds different cloud fractions on the planet. And here you can see the degree of polarization of the planet as a whole, as a function of the phase angle for different cloud coverage fractions. So this is 25%, 50% and 75% and in different colors. So the, the, the pinkish is in the UV and the brown is, uh, is at a thousand uh, nanometers. And, and so the, the band that you can see here is actually the influence of different patches of clouds. 
So the clouds are patchy, but they can be in different locations, depending on the moment of observation, basically, in these simulations. And so the degree of polarization will, will depend on where the clouds are. And so this dependence is larger at the longer wavelengths because there the clouds are more important than at the shorter wavelengths where the radius scattering is more important. And so again, you can see the rainbow over here, very clear, also with eh, only 25% clouds and the Rayleigh scattering peak. And the interesting thing here is that if there is an ocean, then you can see the, uh, you can see the, the color of polarization changing as a function of the phase angle. So what do I mean with that? Is that when you look at this, this graph in the middle with 50% clouds, if you do an observation around 90 degrees phase angle, the polarization would be highest in the UV and lowest at the longest wavelength. But then if you go to larger phase angles, the, the year, the polarization in the UV would be similar to the polarization at the longer wavelength. So the planet would basically be white in polarization. And then if you go to even larger phase angles, that polarization would be highest in the red and lowest in the UV. So the planet would be red in polarization. And the interesting thing is that this crossing, this color crossing, where the planet is white in polarization, depends on cloud fraction. So this is something to look for in observations. And of course, yeah, we don't have such observations from space of the Earth, but we do have some observations of Earthshine data. And so where you observe the dark side of the moon, where it's night on the moon uh, from the Earth. And this is basically a very bad mirror, very bad because it's also very rough. And so it's not very good for polarimetry. So when the polarized signal of the Earth is reflected by the moon, it's, it's depolarized. And we actually don't know how much the depolarization is because this cannot be measured uh, because you have to, for, in order to measure this for the moon, you, have, you need a, a light source with a known polarization and then you can measure the degree of polarization of the reflected light. But we don't have a light source to illuminate the moon uh, with a known degree of polarization. But yeah, you know, there are, of course, there are some tricks to try to correct your measurements of the Earth shine for the depolarization. And here you can see Earth shine measurements uh, from a paper by Michael Sturzig et al. Uh, as a function of the phase angle. So with Earthshine, you also do not get all the phase angles. So we are missing actually the rainbow phase angle because that's not observable from the Earth. But here you can see different colored bands, the degree of polarization of the Earth. And here you can see there appears to be a hint of the planet being white in polarization at longer phase angles. Uh, there are different measurements in here because these observations are taken with the VLT. And depending on whether the observations are in the morning or in the evening, you see either the Pacific Ocean or the Atlantic Ocean illuminated. Eh? The, so you have different parts of the planet. So this is very interesting. And um, yeah, but there are disadvantages of this type of data because we cannot see all the phase angles. We don't know the lunar surface depolarization. And we can also not monitor what happens when the Earth rotates. That's difficult to do, but anyhow. Um, so we are actually trying to get time for new observations <clears throat> with Michael Sturzik, uh, especially because some new computations indicate that also in the absorption bands, the degree of polarization shows interesting features when there is an ocean. This paper was just accepted last week, if I remember well, it's on the archive. And so uh, we did computations for an Earth-like planet with uh, a dry surface, dry black surface, and also with an ocean surface uh, with waves. And here you can see the degree of polarization as a function of the wavelength. This is all for the dry planets with different amounts of clouds. And this is for the planets with oceans, uh, with, yeah, with oceans and clouds. So this is completely cloudy. So you can see that there is uh, not a really a difference between the dry planet that's completely cloudy and the ocean planet that's completely cloudy. This is with 50% clouds, but then the ocean in the ocean planet 
the glint, the reflection of the sunlight is covered by clouds. So again, you see very little difference. But then here on the bottom, um, the glint is not covered by clouds. And then you can see this huge variation in the degree of polarization in the continuum because of the polarization of the glint. And so we have applied for new observations to, to try to observe the glint of the Earth in Earthshine polarization uh, when it's not covered by clouds. So to actually search for this pattern. So maybe we'll be able to do that. So my last <clears throat> slides are about, um, well, what do we actually want to know? We want to know what the Earth looks like from afar in polarization. So, well, we know what the Earth looks like in flux here. This is the famous pale blue dot picture taken by Voyager 1, distance of 6 billion kilometers. So I think this is the Earth indeed here. And this is, of course, a nice, very, very famous picture taken from uh, Apollo 8 that was orbiting the moon. It's called Earth Rise. Um, but of course, when you are on the moon, the Earth is more or less fixed in the sky. Um, and so this is a beautiful picture. So we want to observe the Earth from a distance um, as a whole, because that gives us information that, can, that we can use to validate numerical codes, to really know that what we are computing is right indeed, what our codes are, are working well. You can also test retrieval algorithms. So once you have a measurement of a single dot of light of a planet and you apply a retrieval algorithm and you find very interesting uh, and intriguing results, well, when you, when, once you do that with Earth data, you know actually whether your retrieval is okay or not. Um, and also these types of measurements will really help to know what we have to measure for exoplanets. Yeah? And so that's very important because these future missions will be huge in size and money. Um, so, and this is just an example of what we could measure. So these are model simulations again with MODIS data for the Earth's surface and also for the cloud coverage, total flux and the polarized flux and the degree of polarization. And you see all this variation that is also the rotation of of the Earth or the rotation of the continents getting into view and rotating out of view, and variations in the cloud coverage, lots of information in there. And so, so we have actually plans to do observations of the Earth from distance. Uh, so from the lunar surface, it would look like this. So this is, uh, here you can see the Earth, you are sitting on the moon. This is the night side of the moon, and now it becomes day side on the moon. Uh, and so you can see all the phase angles of the Earth, and the Earth is not really fixed in, in the sky. It's moving a little bit. So that has to do with the orbit of the moon around the Earth. Uh, but you can see that you can get all the phase angles. You can see the glints. Uh, so this is what we want to do. We want to measure the effect of the continents rotating in and out of view. You will notice that the Earth rotates in a different direction than you might expect, but that's because the simulation uh, assumes that the lander is on the south pole of the moon. So our instrument is called LOOP, the Lunar Observatory of Unresolved Polarimetry of Earth. It will be a very small instrument that can basically piggyback on mission. A few papers about LOOP. And recently, there was also a paper by an American group, uh, Boyd et al., that has a similar concept. Not, uh, not with polarimetry, but observing the Earth from the moon, uh, from the lunar surface as an exoplanet. So <clears throat> uh, my PhD student, Dora Klinjik, we uh, adapted an existing uh, spectrometer, Hyperscout, that's built by Cosine, a company in the Netherlands. This instrument has been flying around the Earth since 2018, um, this type of instrument, of course. It's, so it has a very small detector and Hyperscout only measures fluxes, but on a detector from 400 to 1000 nanometers and Hyperscout is an imaging spectrometer. And so Dora adapted Hyperscout by adding layers of optics um, such that, well, what it looks like is this. So you get an image of the earth as a dot in the whole range of wavelength and also for all the different directions of polarization. So here you can see a close-up 
So these are earth images and the line in here indicates the direction of polarization. So you get a huge grid of little earth. You can see here this dark line over here, and that is the oxygen A absorption band, for example. So this instrument will be very small, um, and uh, yeah, it gives all the information we need to the earth. So we are looking for a way to get that instrument in space. It doesn't have to be on the moon. It can also be on an orbiter, for example, but it has to be far away. So um, to summarize, polarimetry provides unique information on planets and exoplanets, especially for the clouds and surfaces. And there is a lot of information that you cannot get from flux data. So it's important to do polarimetry. It's also independent of lots of things like the sizes, the distances to the planets. There are several instrumental effects that disappear when you do polarimetry. Um, and also you are very insensitive to the transmission through your atmosphere. Uh, for most solar system planets and asteroids and comets, it's better to go to space because then you get all the base angles that gives you most of the information. And Traditionally, polarimeters used filter wheels that rotate uh, and that can get stuck. But we have lots of novel techniques that allow us to build very small, very robust polarimeters that are also very precise. So without moving parts. And then of course, we want to have a small mission that will observe the earth as an exoplanet with polarization because then we will get test data or our codes, but also our retrieval algorithms. And we will know better how we can identify habitable exoplanets with future huge space observatories. So in my presentation, I only talked about linear polarization. Of course, there's also circular polarization. That's a whole different topic, um, which is actually very interesting. But there are other people that can tell you more about that. Because circular polarization, uh, is sensitive to, uh, to homo chorality. And that is a unique feature of the building blocks of life on Earth. Uh, for as an example, there are lots of types of beetles that have very polarized, circularly polarized signal. And also vegetation gives off circular polarization. The signal is very small, but it's still maybe the only way to uniquely identify life on other planets. So that is, um, well, a hint for another seminar. And uh, yes, and so um, are there any questions?